Welcome, welcome, welcome to the fourth week of the In Times Like These recap. Now let's get into this, starting with Nichelle, who is called by Zeke to set up a date. Except, Nichelle's not in a lovey-dovey mood. She expresses to her wannabe boo thing how upset she is about Vanessa telling Ulyssa that Ulyssa would go to hell, planning to get Vanessa to end the friendship since Ulyssa is too kind to do so. It also seems like Nichelle could be worried about the wrong thing because she's oblivious to the fact that her younger sister is making herself throw up in the high school bathroom. And when she's approached by Vanessa, she asks about how the Bible stated how people will have new bodies. Vanessa explains that those who give their life to Christ will receive new bodies in the afterlife, wondering why Ulyssa is concerned about having a new body. Ulyssa claims that she's only curious, then Nichelle comes around, telling Vanessa to stay away from Ulyssa. Vanessa doesn't shrivel and tells Nichelle that she won't stop being friends with Ulyssa until Ulyssa says their friendship is over. Nichelle is like, bet. But before she completes her master plan, Nichelle tells Ulyssa that she apologizes about how she reacted when Vanessa shared the gospel message with her. The sisters seemingly make peace, but while Ulyssa, yet again, makes herself throw up in the bathroom, Nichelle unlocks Ulyssa's phone, posing as her telling Vanessa that their friendship is over. Feeling good about herself, she proceeds to call Zeke to ask when they're going on a date while acting like she didn't just end her sister's friendship behind her back. Vanessa vents to Shelly about her supposed friendship with Ulyssa ending. Shelly comforts her daughter, reminding her that the Christian life comes with sacrifices, and losing friends is one of those sacrifices. Shelly encourages her daughter to pray for Ulyssa's salvation, stating that if Ulyssa gets saved, the two would be sisters in a spiritual sense. While Vanessa is upset over losing her best friend because of a huge misunderstanding, I guess nothing can be worse than Alan calling an AI programmer he hired to help break Wanda and Udell's alliance so that the couple won't figure out what they're up to, asking the AI programmer to make a specific portrait of Elvira. What sort of portrait, you may ask? Well, Udell receives a portrait of how Elvira might have looked in present day if she were still alive, and if they were still together. Wanda sees the portrait, certain that it came from the person who's been sabotaging her, and demands that Udell throw it away. At first, Udell is reluctant, but Wanda threatens to throw away the portrait herself. Udell agrees to get rid of it but tries to be slick and takes a picture of the portrait before he has a chance to get rid of the physical copy. Alan's plan seems to be working as he asks his grandmother Clarice if she would quote unquote help Wanda out by practically buying out confidence designs from Wanda. Clarice can't see herself doing something like that, especially since Wanda was Elvira's best friend and would be taking away something that Wanda built from scratch. Alan tried to tell his grandmother that she'd be a co-owner, but Clarice refuses, telling Alan to never mention that to her again. Since that didn't work, Alan asks the programmer to make an AI image of Elvira to somehow ruin Wanda's runway. Maybe this AI image has something to do with the email Wanda got from Elvira, which creeps her out because dead people aren't supposed to send emails. Before Wanda received creepy emails posing to be her dead best friend, she had a few things to say to Devante Torres, telling him how Ben knows that Elvira cheated on Udell back in the day, and how he could figure out that Elvira's secret lover was Devante this whole time. And if Ben keeps on digging deeper, it will only be a matter of time before he discovers the truth. Devante encourages Wanda to keep Ben from finding out the truth, reminding her how they both have a lot to lose since Udell never knew who Elvira cheated on him with and she kept that knowledge to herself throughout their entire marriage. Quinlan approaches Wanda about taking part in Elvira's documentary. Wanda is reluctant, but when Quinlan tries to persuade Wanda to get involved with the documentary, Wanda decides not to do so. While Quinlan has been rejected by Wanda, Ben meets with Udell, asking him if he has any idea where Elvira's diary could be located, informing Udell that the diary was lost, and if he knew who Elvira cheated on him with. Udell answers that he doesn't know anything about the diary and how he still has no idea as to who Elvira cheated on him with. Quinlan meets with Ben, certain that Wanda is hiding something. 
what could Wanda be hiding? Well, if you've been paying attention this entire time, then you might know. At the moment, Ben and Quinlan have a feeling that Wanda didn't want to take part in the documentary because she actually knew who Elvira cheated on Udell with not telling Udell. They both see Ben helping Wanda find out who's been sabotaging her as a way to get close to Wanda. Quinlan asks Udell if he'd like to take part in the documentary. Udell is reluctant since he and Elvira didn't end their relationship on good terms. She assures Udell not to worry about the Russo family. He tells Quinlan about his initial fears of revealing that Elvira cheated on him, but since he's older and doesn't fear the Russos like he used to, Udell agrees to speak on the documentary and he also explains how he will tell the whole truth about their relationship. But when he tells Wanda about this, she is not happy at all. Wanda tries to convince Udell not to take part in the documentary, expressing her fears of the consequences of being a part of it, like how she's being sabotaged, how the public would react to Udell exposing his and Elvira's dirty laundry, how their teenage daughter Yvette would react, and how the Russo family would react. Despite Wanda expressing her concerns, Udell doesn't change his mind annoying Wanda even more. Wanda hasn't been the only person annoyed this week. Esidor has also been through it. He confronts Gianni about Devante threatening to cancel the scholarship event at Theodosius' palace. Gianni admits to what he did to Jeremiah, hiring someone to trash the man's place of business, but refuses to do so as Devante asks by offering an apology or money to Jeremiah, encouraging Esidor to get Isabel to change Devante's mind since Esidor supposedly used to manipulate Isabel when he was her man. Esidor follows his brother's advice, seeing if he can still charm Isabel like he did back in the day. Maybe not since Isabel doesn't seem happy that he had her come all the way over to meet him to make sure that Devante doesn't cancel the scholarship event at Theodosius' palace. She points out that she knew that Esidor didn't create this scholarship out of the kindness of his heart, but to score points with his parents to become the next in line to run Russo Jewelers. Isabel expresses how she'll always take her husband's side and that the meeting with him was a waste of time. The weird thing is that when Isabel leaves, Esidor makes a comment about her not being the one to lecture him about taking vows seriously. I wonder what that's all about. Esidor introduces himself to Shelly, asking for Jeremiah. Shelly tells Esidor to leave because his kind, the Russo kind, ain't welcome here. He doesn't seem to get the message and Jeremiah finally meets Esidor, who seemingly tries to right Gianni's wrongs. Jeremiah doesn't buy the remorseful act, telling Esidor that he's not getting in between Esidor's issues with Devante. This angers Esidor, then he storms out, making Shelly worried that two members of one family are their enemies. Jeremiah assures his wife that they could rely on God to protect them from the Russo family's attacks. But since Jeremiah knows that Devante got involved when he specifically asked him to leave it alone, Jeremiah confronts Devante at Theodosius' palace. While Devante was reminiscing about the beginning of his affair with Elvira, while he was a 22-year-old married man and father, and Elvira was 17. Let me not get off track. Jeremiah tells Devante how his actions have made Esidor his enemy. Devante apologizes, but assures Jeremiah that if Esidor makes any attacks, then he'll have his back. Esidor, running out of options, asks Terry to convince Devante to continue to hold the event at Theodosius' palace. Terry refuses to, asking Esidor to do what he does best and to manipulate Devante into keeping the event at the hotel, giving Esidor an idea. When Devante tells Isabel about how he's threatening to cancel the scholarship event, Isabel informs Devante that Esidor approached her to change his mind. This angers Devante knowing that Esidor did this behind his back, influencing him to make up his mind to cancel the event. Esidor arrives at the Dorval estate when Jeremiah tells Esidor to get out. Esidor does his best to get a specific reaction from Jeremiah, like assault, but Jeremiah doesn't budge, demanding that Esidor leaves. 
When Essidor meets with Terry at the hospital parking lot, he urges her to punch him, telling her to use 20 years of anger from him blackmailing her as inspiration, inspiring her some more by saying that if she doesn't do as he says, then he'll just blackmail her some more, making Terry attack him. But how is this supposed to affect Jeremiah? If you want answers, then find out on Monday. Can't wait that long? Then treat yourself to a binge watch of in times like these. Don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe. You're not ready for what's to come, but tune in anyways.